And good evening. Welcome to the Faith Victory Church and for our midweek Bible study. Glad to have you tonight. Praise the Lord and happy that uh, you've take, decided to take uh, time out and join us. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And I'm going to, uh, here we go, let everybody know we're here, we're on, we're live, and we're ready to roll. Hallelujah. I understand there might be a little static on the audio tonight. Can't figure out why. Um, hopefully it's not so bad you can't follow along. Glory to God. And, and uh, Jesus is Lord. God is good. Amen. And um, we are triumphant church. Glory to God. Uh, reminding you, we are studying the Bible in the light of our redemption by E.W. Kenyon. We encourage you highly to pick up this book. Um, you can actually follow along. And uh, we're not giving you 100%, so you need the book to be able to do this. So uh, buy the book, uh, Amazon.com, or uh, you can get it over at Walmart.com. Glory to God. All righty. Let's, let's get, get on in here tonight. Um, lesson number six uh, from the... Uh, Bible in the light of our redemption is man's need of a mediator man's need of a mediator um, you know the past couple of lessons we've discovered that um, man after he had died spiritually from the committing high treason in the garden needed to receive he needed eternal life um, but God could not impart it, it, that into him with his nature being opposite of God's, so man needed, uh, it could only receive eternal life on the grounds of righteousness. Well, that was the second need of man. And uh, tonight, we get to the third need of man, uh, and that was that of a mediator. Someone who could approach God on his behalf. Man needs a man. But he could not approach God to get the righteousness, so he needed a mediator who could approach God on his behalf to obtain the so he could receive eternal life. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Um, when Adam committed high treason, he was cast out of the presence of God. Uh, he in the unrighteousness, look at John 16, 11. John's Gospel, the 16th chapter and the 11th verse. Those who are maybe coming in late, we're glad to have you. Praise the Lord. John 16, 11 says, Of judgment, because of the prince of the world is judged. <coughs> so man <coughs> stood in the judgment Satan to receive. And man had no standing with deity. He had no right to approach God. Um, man in this universal man, not just, you know, um, Christians or Jews, but universal man um, in the state of spiritual death recognizes he has no standing with God. Think of this. The altars, the temples, the priesthoods of all nations eloquently um, confess man's consciousness of sin. How oh my of sin De uh, declares his fear of death and judgment, and his inability to approach deity in his own righteousness. Think about India. There's like 20 million deities in India. Just a, a glaring representation of the conscientiousness of man knowing he needs a mediator. Uh, you know, think of um, uh, in India where, you, where they worship, or they believe in reincarnation. I believe it's Hinduism that believes in reincarnation. And um, you keep being reincarnated. Um, uh, do what now? And Buddhism. Okay. Okay, um, 
the, you you leave this life, and if you are if you haven't achieved a certain state, uh, you go to a lesser life. Had to come out and be reincarnated and work your way back up the chain <clears throat> until ultimately you achieve that position of of equality with God. Um, they believe cows could be great, you know, the late great Uncle Charlie, uh, who's reincarnated, so they don't eat the cow. They don't eat, they don't eat animals. It be a relative. Uh, I just ate uh, Un Uncle Charlie last night. <laughs> you, know, the, you know, craziness. And, um, but they're all trying to find a way to obtain righteousness and needing a mediator to it, someone to go between them and God. So we, we understand from the things we've already taught that man is unified with Satan. Remember, Jesus said in John 8, 44, ye are of your father, the devil, and the lust of your father you will fulfill. Um, man stands before God as a subject of Satan in vital union with Satan. Uh, Ephesians 2.2. 2. Wherein in time past, you walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. And then 1 John 3.10. In this, the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. Notice that the Bible, you know, <clears throat> We hear all the old songs, you know, that uh, we're all God's children and we're all the family of God. Yet in the Bible, the, the family separates. And if you're a child of the devil, you're in harmony with, you're in union with Satan. Um, the, this identification of man with Satan causes the judgment and unrighteousness of Satan to become man. It's beca man became that. Um, hallelujah. As we said back earlier in John 16, 11, man has become alienated from God. Ephesians chapter 4, uh, verse 18, states, having the understanding darkened, alienated, that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. Because of the blindness of their heart. <coughs> Hallelujah. Um, man became alienated from God. His mind and understanding became alienated by the God of this world. Second Corinthians 4, 4 calls Satan, whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. Okay. Romans 3, 9 through 18. We're going to read here just a minute. I'm sorry, charges against human race in the condition of spiritual death. Let's look at Romans chapter 3. <coughs> Romans 3, starting in verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? No and no wise. For we have proved before, uh, before or we've before proved both Jews and Gentiles, that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one, standeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together to become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asp is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. 
they have known, and the way of peace have they not known. There is fear. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, this is the state of man before redemption. Kind of a sad state there, isn't it? I mean, it, it's not a good thing. Now, listen, you can't quote that as over a New Testament believer. It doesn't apply. But it does show us the state of man before you come to Christ. <clears throat> if you're born again, that's not you. You know, people say, uh, the, you know, you say, well, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. And quote, people quote, there's none righteous, none that one. Now, read your Bible and read it in context. That is, that is a description prior to the new birth. Okay, but that's that's a pretty serious list of stuff there, isn't it? Um, the declaration from the throne of deity is there's none righteous. In other words, but listen, we're, we're, we're back here prior to Christ coming. God looks at the earth and says, there's none righteous. Nobody. What's that mean? Huh? We need a mediator. But there's none righteous. No, not one. So God declares that there is no human <clears throat> that can redeem humanity from the high treasonous act of Adam in the garden to turn over all authority and power to Satan. Humanity is lost and sealed in a state of eternal damnation and in order for that to happen there must be a righteous one who can go and stand before man he needs he needs a mediator but god says there's none righteous no not one goes on says there's nobody that understands nobody that seeks after god ephesians 2 12 Looking over there. Second chapter of Ephesians and verse 12. It says that at the time you were, without, you were without Christ, being aliens from the common and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in this world. Now, here is talking about, he's, he's writing to the Gentiles, to a Gentile church who's accepted Christ. But before, they were without hope, without God. They were aliens from the commonwealth of Israel. They were outside the covenants, had no, no, no access to them. Um, this is the place of spiritually dead men. No covenant claims upon God. Every right that man had in the garden forfeited and turned over to Satan, and man is now the subject of Satan. In his creation by the hand of God, man had stood in righteousness with legal grounds of approach and communion with deity. We know from, um, from Old Testament Scripture and, for, and from the book of Hebrews in particular um, in New Testament doctrine that man's authority covered all the way up to the mercy seat of God. It didn't include the throne of God, but everything else. Why? Because all things that man had authority over had to be cleansed with blood and so when you studied the Levitical priesthood they took the the high priest went in once a year to the mercy seat to cleanse man's sin but that's as far he didn't go to the he didn't go around to the throne where God sits and cleanse it it wasn't tainted why because man's God's man's authority didn't go there it stopped at the mercy seat remember God the, the all things were done according to the pattern which Moses saw in heaven so the whole priesthood, the whole actions, everything was according to the 
this, this condition of man outside of covenant with God, outside of rights and privileges, is described as having no hope and being without God. Where Adam once rejoiced in his fellowship with the Father, he immediately entered into spiritual death and could no longer stand in the presence of God. Look at Genesis 3.8. <clears throat> Genesis chapter 3 and verse 8. And they heard the voice of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God amongst the tree. <coughs> where, <coughs> where before he walked with God, communed with God, and was, was comfortable in the presence of God, now he's hiding from God. Because he no longer has the right to stand in the presence of God because of the fall. Must have a mediator. That means one who can stand before God in righteousness and at the same time represent humanity and approach God on his behalf. He just, he just in between. Now, God's already declared that there's no man that can do that because there's none righteous, no, not one. There's no man that can. But that's what man needs. He needs a man that can go between him and the Father. But there's not one. And being held by Satan in a hopeless and godless state under the sway of spiritual death, man's condition is desperate. As far as human efforts are concerned, his condition is hopeless. There's no grounds for prayer. <coughs> Man has no authority, no right to ask the Father for anything. And if God does hear it, it would Yet the Father of God, in his loving heart, in his care and desire for fellowship, makes a means of approach unto man for himself. Immediately to Adam and to his children, God gave, um, you know, sacrificial opportunity. Look at Genesis 3, uh, 21. And Adam also, and to his wife, did God make coats of skins and clothed them. He clothed them with the uh, skin of dead animals. Verse 4 of chapter 4. And Abel, he also brought first the first things of his flock and the fat thereof. And the Lord had respect unto the offering of Abel. Israel became, and this, this began the sacrificial system. And we refer to that very first where God slayed as the um, Adamic covenant. Or you may pronounce it Adamic covenant. And God uses from that point on a series of covenants. We have the Mosaic Covenant, the Abrahamic Covenant, so forth and so on until we get to the New Covenant. Um, we have the Old Covenant, you know, the overall Old Covenant. Israel's, pro Israel's approach to God was through tabernacles, priesthood, offerings. And outside of God's appointed way, man had and, and, and today still has no approach to the Father God. I don't care if you think you don't like the way God said. That's irrelevant. God said you must come this way. Jesus, you can come along and, and pull this philosophical goobie gog. He was one of many. He was a good teacher. He was one of many, just like Buddha and just like, you know, this one and that one and so forth and so on. No. Because Jesus made this statement that no other has ever made. I am the way, the truth, the 
life. No man cometh to the Father, but that does away with the one of many. I mean, that just ends it. So he is either the only way or the biggest liar and biggest fraud there ever was. He didn't say I was that way. He didn't say there are many other ways. He said I'm the only way. There's no other way. Why? Because man had to have a righteous mediator stand in the gap. There was no other way. Man had an inability to approach God. God gave him a means whereby he could approach, but it was under strict conditions. Had to be done a certain way. And and no and, and only the only tribe that could actually get into the temple was the Levites. And the only one out only ones out of that could actually go into the Holy of Holy was the high priest once a year with the blood of bulls and goats, and not for the sins of the people, but for he entered in once and for all. I mean once that every year to make sacrifice, but then year next year they do the same thing again. To cover the sins of the people. For an atonement. I know they use it in the New Testament. It was a bad translation. Because atonement means simply to cover. We, in, the, in, in New Testament doctrine. We are not covered. Our sin is not covered. We are redeemed. We are washed. We are cleansed. Whereas atoning covered it for a year. Jesus entered in once and for all. For an eternal redemption. Praise God. Um, man can only come to God through Jesus Christ and the just. Of the Father. And throughout the Old Testament, there are many instances of justice that are hard to understand except in the light of man's need for a mediator. Now remember, God could not let certain things go because we would turn them into a teaching and a doctrine. He didn't die many. If if the if God had let that twice okay. So Leviticus 10, 1 through 3, you, you know this story. Uh, they had uh, dedicated the, the put up. And, I mean, the power of God falls, the glory shows up. of Leviticus 9. For the instance, they're on our before the Lord which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from different way than what
well, yeah, Jesus is a way, but you know, Buddha's a way, Krishna's a way, um, you know, the Dalai Lama is a way. Uh, did I say Dalai Lama? <laughs> Dalai Lama. Oh, my. Come up with. He's back. He is a Dalai Lama or whatever. Um, God couldn't let that stand. They were devoured. They were struck dead. Church have an awesome, weighty, solemn responsibility to preach Christ and Christ alone. You cannot mix it with humanism. You cannot mix it with pluralism. You cannot mix it with secularism and come up with different approaches to God, Christian or, or whatever else. You cannot. You're offering strange fire. And it will be burnt up in the end and will not stand before God. God made a way and that is it. Narrow is the way. Straight is the way. Uh, Straight is the way, narrow is the gate whereby you enter in. <clears throat> this is not open for debate. This is not a, uh, well, I think da, da, da. it doesn't matter what you think. It doesn't matter what I think. come and anointed the temple consumed them and they died at the door trying to enter in a different way another example is over in number 16 it's, it's Korah and his uh, he took he, he had a group of people who were jealous of Moses and, and said they had just as much right to approach um, standing in the fields and meditating on flowers and going on smelling stuff and on and um yeah so got moses puts them to the test he invites uh, Corey and his fellows his followers to appear before jehovah with their censers ready for worship as soon as they came moses told all the people to get up from their tents from um of the wicked men who dared to approach God uninvited and in their own way. As soon as Moses had warned the people to get up from the tents of these wicked men, um, the earth opened up and those men and their families dropped in alive in the Sheol. You can't, it, these are all examples of men trying to do it their way and God saying you can't do it that way. Now, this would have never happened. Boy, you don't get to do it your way. I'm narrow-minded because God's way is narrow. Any other way will get you killed to sit to hell. So, yes, I'm narrow about that. And you may not like that. Um, and I can't help it. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if you like it or not. It's the way it is. <clears throat> and then another is 1 Samuel 6, 19. 
First Sammy. First Samuel six nineteen. And he smote the men of Beth Shema, Shemesh, because they had looked into the ark of the Lord. Even he smote of the people fifty thousand three score and ten. That's fifty thousand and seventy. And the people lamented because the Lord had smitten many of the people with a great slaughter. Now, let's look at this. Ark of the Covenant had been captured because of Eli's sin. Had been taken down into Gath by the Philistines, <laughs> where the giants come up from. And after a series of judgments that had fallen upon the heathen cities because of the, uh, the desecration of the ark, they put it back on a cart and sent it back. So it's, we don't want this thing. You know? Um, the people laboring in the field saw the ark. They uh, spread the news, and thousands of people came and gathered in the countryside round about, reverent and curious. Then a bolder spirit then. The others drew near and threw off the heavy covering of the ark. They were not to touch the ark. They were not to touch the ark of the covenant in their fallen state. Now, this is allegorical. Well, why didn't they get the, the heathen? <clears throat> they weren't trying to touch it to obtain anything. They were just, you know, <clears throat> they had captured it. But this is, this is allegorical that if they could touch, because we'd have people preach right now that you can touch the ark as uh, unclean and, 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 uh, you know, get all kinds of blessings or whatever. They're they kind of like the a mindset of the Raiders of the Lost Ark. Remember, Hitler wanted, in, in the movie, Hitler wanted the, the Lost Ark so that he would have the power of the Ark and so forth. You know, it would lay waste to city. You know, the, all the, the goobity gawk of Raiders of the Lost Ark, which is a great movie. Love the movie, um, but biblically inaccurate as to, to the Ark. But there's some ideas that they picked up. And, um, they threw the cover off, and they saw inside of the ark, and a plague struck 50,000 plus. And at this time, at, at, at this time, through the median of the high priest and the priestly sacrifices and the, and the covenant that God had ordered. Man is in a state in need of because of his fallen nature um, unification with Satan he needs that mediator we hear in Job uh, as he cries out how can man stand right with God and we, you know, we know that we taught this before Job is the oldest book of the Bible um, believed to be written by Jobad Um, look at Job 4.12. Me, and mine ear received a whisper thereof. In thoughts from the visions of the night, when deep sleep fell on me, men, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all bones to shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair of my flesh stood up. It stood still. There was silence, and I heard a voice saying, Shall mortal man be more just than God? Shall a man be more pure? Okay. Shall a mortal man be more just than God? And shall a man be more pure than his maker? We have a picture of a man sleeping in his tent. He has a vision, and God asking a question. Uh, shall mortal man be just before God? Shall a man be pure before his maker? That's that's a, uh, a variant reading. The old and eternal problem that's or shall fallen man be pure before his maker. And notice the word mortal is used. Apply applies uh, only to the physical body. 
It means death, doom, frail. In other words, a subject of Satan or the devil. Man became mortal when he passed under the dominion. Condemned in the presence of God. In the ninth in the death rapid rapidity. to the age he says if I say or oh, forget my complaint my sorrows I know that thou wilt not hold me innocent I shall be condemned Job 9 29 even if I try to make it even try I try to sound good even if I try to sound like it's not a bad deal I know I won't be held innocent I know I will be condemned. Every false hope is gone. You ever you ever hope for, you know, some kind of crazy comeback? You know, you're watching a football game. There's, there's you know, 15 seconds left. The other team has the ball in the, you know, kneel, kneel it down formation. And you're just, I got some stupid hope that somehow or another, they're going to fumble the ball. Your team's going to pick it up, running, for, running in for a touchdown, get an onside kick and kick a field goal as time runs out. And you hold on to the last second. It ain't happening. Okay? Um, man is alone with his guilt and despair. Begins to question, why, what is the use of even trying to brighten up and put out, even bother putting out the sad countenance? He's afraid. He's full of sorrow. He's in, um, it is the frankness of his despair, the hopelessness of a full orb knowledge, I shall be condemned. Mine own clothes, man, Job 9, 20, 31, 2 says, mine own clothes or self-righteousness, shall abhor me, for he is not a man as I am, that we should come together in judgment. Job recognizes that self-righteousness doesn't work. Job knew that he could not face God. God is not mortal. He is not under the bondage and guilt of sin as is Job. Job utters the saddest words that ever fell from the lips of a human being. In Job 9.33, there is no umpire betwixt us that he might lay hands upon us both. In other words, there is no mediator between us who has a legal standing with God and at the same time can sympathize This is Job's cry for a mediator. It is not the cry of Job alone. But Job had gathered up the cry for the ages and breathed it forth into one hopeless sob. And Job 9.35, let me get over there. Then when I speak, <clears throat> and not fear him, <clears throat> but it is not so with me. He wanted it. It wasn't so. In Job 25, 4 through 6, how can a man be just with God? How can he be clean that is born of a woman? Behold, even the moon hath no brightness, and the stars are not pure in his sight. 
how much less man that is a worm and the son of man that is a worm boy we pick up the worm mindset here don't we here mal um, the fall of man through e before his mind is in the is in the thoughts here rights and are not pure in the sight of God referring to Adam's treason he turned creation into the hands of the devil Satan has defiled it so God can't even look on his creation with joy anymore if a worm he shows the depths to which he's fallen <coughs> the worm has reference to Satan that old serpent and the man who is termed a worm is spiritually a child of the devil utterly hopeless and without approach to God. Job is voiced clearly man's need of a mediator. Jeremiah recognized this, that man had a need of a mediator. In Jeremiah 30, 21, their prince shall be of themselves, and their rulers shall proceed from the midst of them. And I will cause him to draw near, and he shall approach unto me. For who is he that hath had boldness to approach unto me, saith Jehovah. So here we are, another picture of this coming mediator of the coming Messiah coming out of man but not under the lineage authority dominion of Satan or a fallen man the variant reading says who hath been sh who hath been surety for his heart that he might approach me Jeremiah realized that no man had a right to stand in God's presence or power to do it. And he tells us that there is one being who will be able to draw near. Being uncondemned in God's presence, he's foretelling the mediator whom God will provide for man. Can we all say glory? So let's look at here, at the, uh, in wrapping this up, at the requirements for the mediator. Um, we've already talked about in the past two lessons. He needed righteousness, and but in, in order to get eternal life, he needs righteousness. In order to get righteousness, he needs a mediator. Okay, and so and that can only come through the incarnation of God's Son. The incarnation is the only answer to man's need for. On man's behalf because of the universality, universality of spiritual death. So the requirements of the mediator for man is the following. He must be a man for he must represent humanity. He must possess the capacity to understand and to sympathize with the temptations of man. He must possess a standing of righteousness with deity. Well, there's a problem. There's none righteous, no, not one. But he must be righteous and he must be a man. He must be met by the union of God and man in one individual between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. Let's get into our questions and answers. And um, and if y'all would like, um, I probably ought to uh, print these off with the answers uh, and bring, bring them to church on Sunday so you can have access to them um, to be able to compare. Hallelujah. What, is, what in human history reveals that universal man recognizes that he has no standing with deity. Well, that is the all the temples, altars, priesthoods of all nations confess man's conscientiousness of sin, his fear of death and judgment and his abil inability to approach deity in his own righteousness. And again, you can go back and replay this later, slow it down and, and get this if you want to do that instead of <coughs> trying to get it as I talk because I talk too fast. Number two, give a description of man standing before God 
after sin and what gives scriptures to support it. Man stands before God in vital union with Satan and as his political subject. Scriptural, the, the scriptural support for this is Colossians 1, 13, the first half says 13a, Ephesians 2, 2, and 1 John 3, 10. Why did man need Because man had lost his righteousness with its legal grounds for approaching God. He needed someone who could stand before God in righteousness and at the same time represent humanity and approach God on his behalf. Question four. What were the means of approach unto God that were given to Adam and to his family? The means by which they approached God And what did the incident in Leviticus 10, 1 through 3 reveal to Israel? The striking down of Aaron's sons for bringing strange fire into the temple or tabernacle. And it's real simple. That man could not approach God uninvited or in his own way. Explain two other incidences in the life of Israel that showed man's need of a mediator. Well, when Korah and the company of leaders insisted they had as much right to approach God as Moses and Aaron, um, Moses put them to the test. When they followed their way upon the earth, the earth opened up and swallowed them. And when the Philistines were returning the Ark of the Covenant to the people, uh, the, the people of God, uh, Israel drew near to see the event. Someone threw off the covering of the Ark and 50,000 people were struck with a plague and died. Number seven, how did Job's voice, I'm sorry, I didn't read that right. How did Job voice man's need of a mediator? He did it when he stated this, there is no umpire betwixt us that he might lay hands upon us both. Explain and give the scripture in Jeremiah that showed man's need of a mediator. Job 30, 21, and their prince shall be of themselves. Their ruler shall proceed from the midst of them. I will cause him to draw near. He shall approach unto me. For who is he that hath boldness to approach unto me, saith Jehovah. And that's out of the ASV, the American Standard Version. Jeremiah foretells of the mediator that will be able to stand before God because no one else could. Question nine. What were the requirements of a mediator for man? <clears throat> a. He must be a man, for he must represent humanity. B, he must possess the capacity to understand and sympathize with the temptations of man. C, he must also possess a standing of righteousness with deity. And D, he must not be a subject of Satan. He must be free from all satanic authority. And number 10, how can man's need of a mediator be met? And man's need for a mediator can only be met by the union of God and man and one individual. And that had to be the man, Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Glory to God. I hope y'all are enjoying uh, going through these lessons. <clears throat> there's, there's, you know, and I know you're reading it and we're covering it and going back over it, but um, next week's the promised incarnation. Hallelujah. Well, Mary had to be sinless in order for Jesus to be sinless. Well, then Mary's parents on both sides had to be sinless. And then their parents had to be sinless. And then their parents all had to be sinless. It's, it's just, forget it. That's something that somebody dreamed up in the mid-1800s. It's just, you know, the incarnation is a supernatural event. Jesus is without sin. His father was God. Was God, is God, always will be God. 
Hallelujah. So we do get into the uh, incarnation next week. Glory to God. And um, be blessed. Don't forget to join us on Sundays. We're teaching on the fruit of the Spirit. We look forward to having you with us. Until we meet again, remember these words from 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. Whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. God bless you. We love you. See you next time here, Faith and Victory Church, online.